Good morning. Welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium and this session, Advancing the Science of Reading in Higher Education in Pennsylvania. My name is Karen Deary and I'm joined by my colleague, Jenny Alicandri from the Central Patent and Harrisburg Office. We're excited to facilitate this session for everyone, but before we start, we have a few housekeeping items to review. You can access the presenter handouts for this session. Um, you will, we will post session handouts um, they're not available on the platform right now, but they will be in the future. Uh, but you can always access our um, patent link. And I'm gonna drop that in the chat box for you right now, just in case you didn't grab it from the waiting room. As a reminder, this session will be recorded and is 75 minutes in length, which includes a 15 minute question and answer period at the end. However, our presenters do welcome questions throughout the presentation. If you would like to drop any questions, into the chat, they are happy for us to interrupt and ask the questions in real time. So please feel free to put those questions in the chat box to Jenny and I, and we'll pass those along to our presenters. To access closed captioning, click on the icon CC Live Transcript on the Zoom control panel. If you experience technical um, difficulties, please go to the technical support guides area above the schedule on the symposium page. In Zoom, please keep your video feature off and stay muted to eliminate any potential distractions during the presentation portion of our session. We would love for you to tweet out or share on social media all that you learn from this next three days of our literacy symposium. The hashtag for the symposium is hashtag patentlit2022. We'll post that in the chat for you too, just so you have that. And now it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you our presenters for this morning, Dr. Esther Lindstrom, Dr. Kathleen Biddle, and Dr. Lori Severino. So Dr. Severino, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're very excited to be here and share with you um, information about our higher ed programs for teacher prep. I'm gonna share my screen for a couple slides. Um, so just an introduction to us. So we have uh, Dr. Kathleen Biddle, who is at Juniata College, and um, she is going to be presenting about the pre-service program they have at their university. Um, Esther Lindstrom, who is from Lehigh, and she is going to be talking about their graduate programs. And then myself, I'm at Drexel University, and I'll be sharing about our pre-service and our in-service teacher prep programs. But we of course want to know about you also. So if you could put in the chat what your role is and what state you're in, we need to know if we're talking to just Pennsylvania folks or if people are coming from all over. Give everybody a minute to put their info in the chat. Okay, I'm seeing elementary teacher from Arizona, ITT teacher in Hungary, Middletown, Wisconsin reading specialist, literacy coach in Pennsylvania, professor of special education in PA, reading specialist PA. Pennsylvania teacher, special education, Pennsylvania, majority from Pennsylvania, professor in the PASHE system, Mifflin County, a coach from Arizona, assistant professor at South Georgia State College, literacy coach, a part-time professor, New York from Corning, Michigan, program coordinator for CCSU in Connecticut, New York, Erie, Texas, all over. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And it sounds like we have a good mix of um, teachers, maybe some administrators and reading specialists and professors. So that's awesome it could, because it takes all of us to make this change happen. So um, glad that everybody's here. Thanks for joining us. All right, so the first thing we wanted to share is if you're not already familiar with the um, IDA knowledge and practice standards for the teachers of reading, 
We do have a link that um, Karen will share in the chat box if you don't have them, but this is just a, a snapshot of the standard one and standard two, but really what has been happening in Pennsylvania. So we will be talking a little bit about Pennsylvania since we're all Pennsylvania schools. Um, Pennsylvania has the most IDA accredited universities in the nation. And that was not by accident. Um, it was a very purposeful um, push. And so we can talk a little bit about that, but there's uh, not everybody that is following the standards has accreditation. It's a long um, process and it's it's costs money to get accredited. So universities and colleges don't always have that access to do that, but they may be following the standards. And that's the most important thing is if you can follow the standards and put these things in place, especially for our pre-K four and pre-K six teachers in in-service and in um, pre-service particularly, it's really good to have those in there. So you should, if you're not already familiar with them, I highly recommend that you um, pull those down and print them out and save them because there's a lot of very specific detail in there about things that we wanna make sure our teacher educators are aware of and know, not just know it, but can apply it. And then um, and also in Pennsylvania, we just recently had our chapter 49 regulations updated to include that um, university programs have to include structured literacy in their coursework, which is brand new from this summer or from this spring. So, um, you know, we're having a lot of discussions in Pennsylvania around that and what that looks like. So some of us are gonna share our syllabi and we'll talk about that. So if you have questions about anything in the syllabus, we're happy to share that. Um, another critical piece to how this all happened was um, we have a read by fourth grade campaign in Philadelphia and very active um, subcommittee in teacher prep. And probably some, Folks that are, are here today are also on that committee. So thanks for joining us here too. Um, but really there's been a push for us to work together and help each other out because when you're trying to do these types of changes in your program, it's not always easy. We can talk about that and answer questions about that. But there's also a link that um, we'll be put in the chat about the read by fourth, um, actually I can see if I can click on this. I think it will come up. Nope, I have it next, I think. Don't let me, there we go. So you can always take a picture of this and download this guide. So this is brand new. You're the first to hear about it because it just got finalized. Um, but this is an information packet that we are going to promote to, um, guidance counselors, to high school students, to know what to look for in a teacher prep program and know what questions to ask when they are at their um, open houses or when they're at visitation days, talking to pro potential professors. Um, and then also those of us that are implementing this work, we will have these guides out at our open houses for the students to actually realize that these are incorporated in our programs already, and here's how we address them. Um, so this is a great handout. So if you want to um, take a look at that and see what kind of questions we're going to encourage seniors to start asking when they're starting to look for programs that they want to apply to in education. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen, and she is going to talk about her program at Juniata. Unmute Dr. Biddle. It's classic. I do that all the time. Okay. So um, I want to share my screen. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. <clears throat> Are you able to see it? Not yet. Okay. Um, here, share screen. Um, 
Okay, let me just put That's it on. good. Okay, good. So thank you everyone for attending this morning. Um, <clears throat> my my um, role in today's uh, panel is to talk about my, our pre-service teacher training in the science of reading at Juniata College. Um, and uh, a little bit of background about what motivated us to move to the science of reading from what had previously been a balanced literacy approach um, to teaching reading in our institution. Um, for one, um, the certification changes and the increase in literacy competencies that came out several years back uh, were up, I saw as an opportunity to radically change the literacy strand in our program um, and to introduce the science of reading to our pre-service teachers. Um, what you see here are snippets of our students um, in their sophomore year in our class titled Language in the Developing Brain. Um, and you can see there are they're working with the phoneme charts and trying to match things. Um, the other motivation I had was community outreach. Um, we're a very small liberal arts college in central Pennsylvania. We have high rates of poverty. Um, our local school district has 65% of children receiving free and reduced lunches. We also have low rates of literacy achievement. We consistently score below the state average uh, for um, literacy proficiency. Um, many of our pre-service teachers come from similar rural small towns, and many of our students remain um, in the area working with our local school districts in the county. Um, and so that was sort of the motivation for me um, to be really um, present a very rigorous literacy strand for pre-service teachers. Um, this is a, an overview of the program. Um, in sophomore year, our students take a course titled Language and the Developing Brain. Um, we focus primarily um, birth to um, fourth grade, and we talk about, we use three different texts in that class. One is um, Language Development by Levy and Polarstock. Um, then we also use Speech to Print, both the text and the workbook, um, and work with the kids, uh, the students, um, on understanding the phonemes, uh, as we understand that many of our pre-service teachers have come from balanced literacy uh, instruction in their own um, school instruction in reading. Um, and so it is somewhat of a novelty for them to understand the phonemes, but we work very hard on that. And we pair it with um, a field placement in grades K through two, um, where students complete a variety of uh, assignments and beginning with rather general assignments such as, you know, what is the variety of language use in the classroom where you are? And then we begin to tailor it down to more specific assess, um, assignments such as they administer the CTOP uh, to a typically developing reader and a struggling reader. Uh, they take oral language, oral narrative samples from a typically developing reader and a struggling reader um, to emphasize that important uh, bridge from speech to print. Um, and so we analyze those narratives and then we look at uh, the subskills that would support reading achievement. And um, along with this, this particular course, we begin our assessment to be certain that the students are actually mastering the concepts that we are trying to teach. Um, many of you attended Louisa Moat's keynote speak, speech this morning where she showed her data um, from in-service teachers on um, the survey of language knowledge. This is the brief survey from Motes and Russell. And we uh, do both pre and post assessment in the language and the brain course. And as you can see, our students were very, very low initially on phoneme counting. Um, they, they gained substantially. The changes were significant for phoneme counting, phonological matching, sound symbol correspondence, and definitions and concepts. Uh, yet they still were not proficient at, that, at the end of sophomore year. Um, syllable counting was something they could all do very easily. So we don't spend a lot of time on the course. We talk about it, but the majority of our time is spent on these other language concepts that they really do need to master. Um, and we continue to, to do the pre and post um, into the senior year and we see continuing growth, um, but we weren't still weren't seeing sufficient growth. So we changed the lineup of our courses and moved our Lang and Lit course to junior year to be sure that sophomore, junior, and senior year, they were, they were being reinforced on these concepts of reading. Um, we also give them the IDA standards and guidelines um, so that they, they know what, what we're aiming for in each of our courses. 
So language and literacy is in the spring of junior year. Um, it includes a field experience in an inclusive classroom um, where they can work with both typical and struggling readers. And then in reading difficulties, um, which is the senior fall year um, semester, we have a course on reading difficulties. We continue to work with speech to print and the workbook. And then we also have our reading difficulties clinic, which is better known as ROAR. So the Rural Outreach and Reading Clinic um, is a program where we collaborate with our local school district. Um, teachers and parents can refer students to the clinic. Um, our students in that clinic do pre and post assessments of subskills related to reading achievement. And the results of those assessments inform their instruction. We have a number of um, evidence-based reading programs, as well as decodable text in our program. Um, and at the end of that, that course and field experience, the students generate a capstone case study on the children or child with whom they are working throughout the semester. And that includes informal and formal assessments. It includes descriptions of the intervention and um, recommendations for home and for school. Um, I'm going to show you one assessment that we, um, it's a piece of an assessment that we do. Um, we have a self-assessment of preparation to teach struggling readers and writers um, that my, myself and my colleague, Catherine Adams, developed. Um, this is one snippet of it. So it measures self-efficacy to teach struggling readers and writers. Um, but there's another component of that uh, survey that we do pre and post that also um, measures perceptions of dyslexia, and it's an adaptation of a Washburn tool to measure that. Um, and we see significant gains in the perceptions about dyslexia. Um, and importantly, we also see gains in self-efficacy around concepts um, related to reading and writing. So this was how confident do you feel to teach a struggling reader? And we see um, changes in that self-efficacy we also see that in the writing component. Um, <clears throat> um, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, and in terms of future directions for us, um, we are expanding our outreach in the community to include pre-K settings in the upcoming academic year. Um, we are also going to be pursuing IDA accreditation for our program. And um, finally, I am on the higher ed task force for Pennsylvania, and I plan to continue to participate in that as well. Um, I feel that um, this literacy piece is really about social justice, um, and it's really about expanding opportunities for a lot of children who otherwise would have a lifetime of underemployment or unemployment and not access to many of the things that our society deems as a success in life. Um, so that is a quick overview of our program. Um, and I'll turn it over to back to Lori. Thanks, Kathleen. That was awesome. I enjoyed learning about your program too, although I knew a lot of this stuff before, but it's nice to see those um, results again. It's so impressive. Um, Karen, do we have any particular questions that came through from that? There aren't any program specific questions at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk to you about Drexel's program. Uh, Lori, yeah. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Um, Jeff Bond said that was fantastic and he would love to be in touch with Dr. Biddle around outreach work in lower SESPA type districts. So I will you share contact information? We can find it on our platform, on our conference mm -hmm. page. I absolutely am happy to share information. I can put my email in the chat. Would that be helpful? That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, sure. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, one of the things that um, I think surprises people is how collaborative the higher ed faculty are amongst universities, right? People always think we're not willing to share and you know, you got to protect your program, but they're all done so differently and um, still effectively. So it doesn't all have to be done one certain way. Um, so we, I'm going to talk a little bit about our BS in education program, especially for those pre-K four teachers. We have a master's in special education with a focus um, 
and, and a certificate in dyslexia specialist. And then we also have a reading specialist cert um, that I'll talk about that is also at the master's level. So for our pre-service teachers, um, they do have three literacy courses similar to Kathleen spread out over um, sophomore, junior, and senior year. And one of those courses is specifically on structured literacy. It's one of the courses that all teacher ed um, folks have to take, no matter if they're secondary, elementary, it doesn't matter. They still take the structured literacy course um, on content development. I do have a sample syllabus that um, Karen can put in the chat that if you want to look at that, not everything is in there, like all of our links to Drexel stuff, but I kept all the content in there. And in that course, they also have a field placement that is attached to the course where they actually have to do assessments. Uh, they work one-on-one -on -one with a student in, usually in the Philadelphia public school system. They assess a student to try and identify area of need for in reading. And usually the student is selected because they need some support in reading. The undergraduate student then is learning um, phonemic awareness activities, phonics skills, fluency comprehension. And they had some of that in their previous courses that they can now apply. And so they go out and we do a flipped field placement, which has been very effective. So actually the course takes place in the school building. So everybody's in the same school. We, as the professor, we go to that school to hold class and we have um, half of the time that they're there, they're in classroom with us, the professor. And then the other half, they're working with um, a K through, um, usually K through four, student and they're actually implementing the intervention that they've come up with to based on the student need. Um, we have done some research around the flipped classroom also and have a publication out um, that is available, I think, on ResearchGate. So if you need that, just contact me through that way. Um, but we looked at, similar to Kathleen, their knowledge, but also their self-efficacy about pre and post. We found that um, there were gains in knowledge across the board, but interestingly enough, we also compared it to our online course, since we also have this online where it's not necessarily a flipped classroom, and the knowledge actually was higher, more statistically significant for the people that took it online than the people that were with us in person, which we found very surprising. We kind of think about on an online course, you can go back and access that information as much as you want, and you can slow things down. You can do it when you're ready and able to take in that information. Whereas when you're in class, you know you have to be there and ready and willing to hear and accept all that information and then apply it all at one time. We did find that across the board, whether they took it online or in person with the flipped classroom, that um, all their self-efficacy went up by the end of the term. And then um, we also have a specific course directly for kindergarten and first grade uh, literacy, early literacy um, skills. And that really goes into an in-depth look at phonemic awareness, phonics, and applying those in a kindergarten and first grade classroom, what that would look like. In our special ed masters with the dyslexia specialist, they still take that one course that's in structured literacy. They take it whether they're an undergrad or a graduate student. It's um, some of the assignments are a little different for the um, master's level and some of the amount of hours for field experience are different. But other than that, the content is generally the same. Um, they also take the K-1 focus early literacy course and then they receive Wilson level one certification. So they take all the Wilson courses through the program so that when they have the dyslexia specialist certificate, they have a Wilson level one cert, they have their um, special ed masters, and then they have um, a dyslexia specialist certification. So lots of uh, bonuses in that one that also is IDA accredited currently. And then lastly, we have our reading specialist was also 
Um, one of the unique things about our reading specialist is it does have the Wilson level one reading um, certification in it, which um, tends to be a big bonus for people that are reading specialists. We've also found that folks that came and did our, our level one, um, they immediately get reading specialist positions because they have their Wilson level one certification. Um, they do take a literacy and evaluation course also in giving assessments, reading the data, doing progress monitoring, um, using data to inform instruction. And then the culminating experience is that they have to design and implement a tier two summer camp, similar to I think what Kathleen's doing with her undergrads, uh, where they actually plan the entire um, program. And we do pre and post testing on the students that, that usually is, um, third, fourth, and fifth graders that we're working with. Um, also through the Philadelphia School District is usually those kids that attend. And um, so they run the summer camp and they do pre and post assessments on the kids. And we have statistically significant results over a four week period for the pre-K or for the third, fourth, and fifth graders. So um, pretty exciting there. And I just wanted to lastly share, this was a reflection that came just um, this term from a student one of our pre-service teachers, so undergrad, who was doing the, um, the flipped classroom. And so they were a secondary teacher, not necessarily going to be teaching reading or English language arts, um, but saw it as important to know what structured literacy is. But I love that they said this could look like differentiating assignments and lessons using different materials, graphic organizers, scale, scaffolded text, making content more accessible. Like these are undergrads and they're realizing they're gonna have students with IEPs in their classroom. Um, and what are the things that they can do even in teaching science um, or math, which is what this person's um, major was. So um, we still want, all teachers, not just the pre-K four, but all teachers, no matter what they're teaching, to have a good understanding of what this looks like. And I am going to stop and turn it over to Esther, who is gonna talk about Lehigh's program. Excellent, thank you so much, Lori. Um, I know that Drexel has been a big leader in Pennsylvania in this area, so every time, um, you know, I meet with Lori or hear more about what's happening. There's always these new developments that are really exciting and that we can all learn from in our programs. Karen, do you have any more questions while we're in this transition moment? I don't have any right now for you. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to set up to share my screen. All righty. And let me just make sure. I've got that all sorted out. Y'all see that? We do. Excellent. Okay. All righty. So as Lori mentioned early on, I am at Lehigh University in the College of Education. We are in um, Eastern Pennsylvania. I am an assistant professor in the special education program. So our um, College of Education is graduate only. This is our building right here. We can see it from, we can see all the um, sides of the Lehigh Valley. So I just like to share that because um, it's really pretty, especially um, in the spring and the fall. So because we are a graduate only um, college, we have a really limited um, area in which we can um, focus on reading. And so my colleague, Dr. Brooke Sawyer and I really try to, em we try to enmesh it as much as we can um, throughout our graduate programming. And so we have two primary courses that are focused on um, the science of reading. And so Dr. Sawyer um, teaches um, TLT, Teaching, Learning, and Technology 420. And this has an emphasis on pre-K to grade four. Um, she focuses on the five areas of reading and these really foundational skills and practices that are necessary for high quality evidence-based reading instruction for everybody, um, but especially to support struggling readers and to minimize the amount of referrals we see to special education. Um, there's a practicum component associated with all of our classes, um, and so these two are no different. Um, one of them um, for Dr. Sawyer's class, um, they do individualized instruction. Um, they have small groups that they meet with, and then 
She's also started um, this new program in which <coughs> her students can meet with um, data teams and see how data-based decision-making happens in districts. And so allowing that practicum component to be both at the um, in the instructional realm, but also in understanding how that fits into the larger, um, the larger context. Um, so Karen, thank you for sharing that syllabus. Um, so that's an example syllabus from last fall. Um, so I teach special education 419, um, and that's our intensive reading intervention course. And so um, Brooke and I have created what we call an alliance. Um, and so we have our students, even though um, her general education students are not required to take my course and my special education students are not required to take her course, we really see the value in our students completing both of those. And so we have, um, we, we encourage our students to take her foundational course and then use my course as an opportunity to dive in deeper because we are limited um, by the amount of courses that we can offer in reading in a single master's program. Um, we have to be a little bit clever um, and we have a lot of ground to cover. So my course um, spans grades K through 12. Um, and we have a focus on learning disabilities, um, which I think is pretty typical, um, but I make a point of bringing in other populations as well. And so um, one of my specific interests is in reading instruction for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And there's a lot of research in the last 10, 15 years that shows us that we can really adapt that what we found from the science of reading that works for students with LD um, and struggling readers and make really systematic adaptations as far as delivery is concerned to meet the needs of students with IDD and raise our expectations for this group. So for me, it's really important in this class to emphasize how we can make these adaptations, these qualitative or quantitative adaptations, how we can introduce visual supports, for example, how we can in introduce behavioral supports and increase engagement to meet the needs of students with um, EBD, IDD, students who are English language learners, how we might be approaching their instruction a little bit differently, but still with that foundation of the science of reading um, and those decades of research that have gone into that. Um, so again, there is that deeper focus um, in, in this course where we take things a little bit further. And then the practicum for my course under typical circumstances um, is using the direct instruction methods, um, capital DI, and data-based individualization. And so it's a one-on-one -on -one tutoring program where students are, where teachers and service teachers are identifying their um, struggling readers. And those might be struggling readers who have not yet been identified with learning disabilities. They might already have a diagnosis or they might have one of these other um, labels that we see here. And so um, with that, with that idea of inclusivity, we've designed the class. And so then the students use their class meeting time um, to talk about the data that they're collecting from their students and make those um, and make those decisions about what kind of content they're going to focus on in the next session. So we tend to pack a lot into, um, into these semesters, um, but I think that's just a reflection of how important it is to us. And I mentioned that my colleague is in the general ed program. I'm in the special education program. One of the things that really appealed to me when I was um, interviewing at various universities and looking for a faculty position, um, something that stood out about Lehigh and a, and a few other places um, was that Brooke Sawyer, my colleague and I were both aligned in supporting the science of reading. And so sometimes special education instructors um, are more siloed and they might have to um, do a lot of the legwork as far as the science of reading is concerned, or they might take more of that on. Um, and one thing that really appealed to me and I think has served me well at Lehigh um, and I think is a model um, that can be really successful is when the general education and the special education teacher are aligned in that philosophy. Um, and I don't have to unteach anything that Brooke has taught. Um, and like I said, I'm already trying to pack so much into one semester um, that having that foundation and having that alignment between the two programs uh, really strengthens us as far as the opportunities that are available for us externally, um, but also what our students are able to do in internally. Okay, so we might have some questions um, about text and materials later on, but I just wanted to give 
a quick visual um, that these are some of the things that we're drawing on. Like I mentioned, I use the direct instruction reading. This is our primary text. I don't like to overload students with um, expensive textbook requirements. Um, I like this one because it's adaptable and because it's the principles from that that can be um, used in a lot of different, um, with a lot of different other curricula and, um, and drive what we know to be effective instruction. So I don't um, expect that districts are using these, but this gives our students an opportunity to really understand these foundational elements of reading instruction. And of course, pairing that with Anita Archer's book, um, which is invaluable to say the very least. Um, one thing You're I do wanna point out here, um, as far as um, texts are concerned is self-paced phonics. And so what we see and what those of you who are in higher ed might be noticing is that um, our students, whether they're in-service teachers or pre-service teachers, themselves have learned reading a variety of ways. And so when we do the poll about in my classes about who has learned reading um, using phonics or who had a whole language approach, oh. there really is a mix. And so one of the things that I have oh. to cram into the semester and Brooke has started to as well is to teach our students phonics. And so we use this self-paced phonics guide for our students to be able to um, go through and understand um, phonemic awareness more, um, more deeply, or they might need additional support in syllabification or the other areas that are important for them to first understand before, then, before they can teach um, students to learn how to read. Um, we know that there's ample research to show that just spending time on evidence-based practices um, isn't enough for teachers, but teachers actually have to know these things themselves. So as a higher ed um, faculty member, um, I see it as my responsibility for teaching that. And I know that we do that in different ways in this panel uh, that my colleagues can share about as well. So, um, and lastly, right here, the National Center on Intensive Intervention. During COVID, we didn't have an opportunity to have our traditional practicum and our individual um, tutoring opportunities. And so um, I found the NCII modules and in intensive reading intervention really valuable for building up some of those um, practical skills. And you'll see that the, um, the syllabus that I shared was from one of those so-called COVID semesters where we didn't have the practicum, um, but this was a, this was a decent approximation um, given, given that we had that limitation. So I wanted to share that with you just because just when we think we've got our semesters figured out and we've got our materials and our tools and all of our favorites, um, you know, something something comes from um, from left field. And so NCII has been um, really working hard to make those modules accessible. Um, and there's something that I share when districts are reaching out for information as well, because I think they're really well developed and our students have learned a lot, um, especially about making data based um, decisions in their reading instruction. So we have some ideas for moving forward. Um, we, Brooke and I recently were um, awarded a small internal grant for um, developing uh, research to practice focus within our master's program. And so um, we've talked about resource limitations and we're trying to be really systematic about this and um, develop our programming in a way that's sustainable and, um, and strong and aligned with, um, with evidence-based practices. And so we have an action, resource, er, an action research course that we're developing because we have so many students who are in-service teachers. Um, we wanna make sure that they're also getting opportunities to engage in research, to better understand the connection between research and practice um, and to be able to unite those. Um, as always, it's really important to strengthen our partnerships with local districts, intermediate units, uh, reaching beyond our um, typical partners, but then also getting community partners engaged, um, especially for students who are less likely to be involved in high quality reading instruction and have less and are less likely to have teachers who are trained in this area. And then um, moving forward, we're also interested in pursuing IDA accreditation um, because it's really important and um, we're just a couple steps away. So um, I think that, that will, that's something that we're both really looking forward to as far as this is concerned. So that's what I have for you today. Um, I'm really interested to hear what questions folks have um, and I will stop sharing the screen. Thanks.
so Dr. Lindstrom, you shared with me a link to some of the partnership work, I, I think, that you're doing. Oh, with yeah. Samuel. Did you want to address that? Yeah, thanks so much for reminding me, Karen. So um, in the spirit of um, in the spirit of addressing reading instruction for students um, beyond LD designations or beyond struggling at risk readers, um, Lehigh, one of the unique things about Lehigh is that we have a partnership with Centennial School, which is a school for students with intensive behavioral needs. And so some of those students have EBD, autism, um, and so this school is, um, is within Lehigh's network. And so we have a lot of our students completing their practicum at Centennial School. And so they get to see how reading instruction, high, high quality evidence-based reading instruction can happen within um, a really well-oiled PBIS um, setting. And so how do these behavioral supports combine with high quality reading instruction um, beyond what we can write about in research-based articles um, and these hypotheticals? So that is a really, um, that's a program that we're really proud about um, and, in, and that integration of those supports. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that because um, because Centennial is truly a special and positive place. Um, and it's great to be able to match all the um, all of the strong things that they're doing as far as behavior is concerned um, with high quality academic instruction as well. So thanks so much for that um, reminder, Karen. You're very welcome. That's an important piece, I think, of the program. So to see those partnerships. Um, yeah, so if I can jump in and add to that, Karen, I think that's, it's getting much better and easier to place students in, in classrooms where they're going to see signs of reading in action, where I would say probably five or six years ago, that was not the case. So um, I think those of you that are in school districts, if you can, it's going to have to come, I think, from the ground up. Yes, it's coming from PDE and it's coming from the Department of Ed. It's coming down to higher ed, um, which is one aspect of it. But I think if districts start expecting and saying to the universities that we want teachers to know this coming out, that's what's going to get it to change. So I think in 2017, or 18, um, the superintendent of the Philadelphia School District, um, Dr. Height, did make the statement that he, by 2020, he wanted to hire only teachers that came from IDA accredited universities, which is again, why you see so many Philadelphia universities accredited or following the IDA standards, right? That's, he's a big employer, and it made a lot of noise to the schools of ed saying, you know, this is this is what we're looking for. This is the direction we're going. We need teachers. We can't train them once they come to us. They have to be trained already. That's such an important point, Dr. Severino. And people in the chat are certainly agreeing with you. And Dr. Lindstrom, they were happy to see Dr. Archer's book as one of your core texts. That explicit instruction, I know, in, in my experience, has been so helpful, especially when you're talking about across the ages, K through 12. Um, you know, that spans certainly all of that work.